will need to assess a child to um, get preschool services. Thankfully, after confirming with San Andreas Regional Center, I can say with great excitement that we have no pending preschoolers at this time, um, because I don't know how we would assess a two and a half year old in this format. Um, so that, thankfully, we don't have anyone pending assessment. Um, we do have students who do have services though, and what we're doing is we're providing the service actually to the family, teaching the parents, giving them the tools and resources that they need to be able to work with the child. Um, as you can imagine, our teachers who are on board know how difficult it is for our uh, kindergarten through eighth graders to participate. Can you imagine a three and four year old trying to participate in this kind of format? Um, another piece that has been relaxed for special education is the DRDP, and that's a progress monitoring assessment that speech and language gives to um, the students to check on their growth. Um, and luckily that has been canceled for this data collection cycle. And then the last piece of the puzzle for special education is we still are responsible for our CalPADS data and our data database, our special education database, Cyrus, to, um, to be in alignment with one another. And that information is still being collected for accuracy. I did a check yesterday, and out of the 100 records that have been reported, we only had two errors and seven warnings. And I've been trying to recapture the data, and um, the biggest um, um, challenge I have is with the over 80 hands-on um, art lessons that I have. So I've taken the originals home and I'm going to start scanning them and then tweaking them. So I have about six or 700 pages that I'm trying to get back into a dat dat uh, database. Cause I think it's important, you know, um, part of our school, the art docent program, we have to have an updated database, you know, that, that, um, we can use every year and, 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 and my docents can use and all of that. Um, um, the one other thing that was built based off the guidelines from the CDE. So the first part of this is the CDE's definition of distance learning and what they would like to see in the plan, what they're hoping for in the plan. It's not a plan that needs to be a, approved by the CDE, but they are recommending that something is put out to parents we do have a great website that Joe put together in that very short period of time, our COVID-19 website, uh, uh, which is linked into this document in a couple of places. Um, but just making sure that we have kind of a what we expect of the kids and what we're hoping for for the kids kind of at the end of this school year. Um, so there is a link in this document to the full, um, sorry, to the CDE's page. Um, where they get more into detail about distance learning expectations um, and what they're looking for as well. So that was kind of the frame for building this document. Um, the next piece of this talks about instructional expectations. So if we look at instructional expectations, um, as you can see, the younger the student, the less time they are able, we feel, to be attentive um, to that instruction, especially for the teacher. I know as a parent of a kindergartner, he is very attentive in his kindergarten class, but with me as his parent, um, maybe not quite so much. It's a little bit different and a little bit more difficult. Um, so building that time and then splitting it up, not just saying if you're in kinder or first grade, you should sit down for an hour and a half and get your work done, but looking at it in a way that's a little bit different. So um, one and a half, one to one and a half hours for kinder and first, two to two and a half for second and third, three to three and a half for fourth and fifth, and same for sixth through eighth. And then just the different ways that the day is broken up over those time chunks for each of the grade level spans. Kindergarten teachers have a Zoom at least once a week and first grade is Zooming, it sounds like every day for check-ins. Can, uh, second grade is at least once a week, if not more, and uh, third grade as well. Fourth and fifth grades are Zooming with their students at a minimum of three times a week, sometimes more. And sixth through eighth grade students have a 150 minutes of a live Zoom. So it's 30 minutes per teacher. And as Joe talked about in his update, that's broken out uh, by subject area. 
uh, parent communication is done through Google Class. I'm sorry, it's done through Parent Square, and a lot of the and I'll get into the different platforms that parent that the teachers are using to communicate with students and parents as well. <laughs> Moving on to the guidelines for distance learning. Um, we want to make sure that we're, again, not focusing just on the academic piece of this. So we talk about establishing routines throughout your day. That's going to look different for every single family, uh, depending on how much parents are having to work, when parents are having to work, when parents are having to Zoom, and when their kids are having to Zoom. So coming up with a routine that works for your family, uh, putting together a workspace that feels like a workspace that you can be in and focus in, checking your messages and and getting all of those pieces of communication on the academic side. But what I like about this section is that it also addresses that social emotional piece. Um, establishing quiet time for reflection, that it's not just difficult for kids, it's difficult for parents, it's difficult for everyone who's in the house. We all miss our friends, we all miss our families. So making sure that there's that time away from a screen that's quiet and you have time for reflection. Um, making sure that you're moving and exercising and getting outdoors. <laughs> Sorry, the sun is directly in my eyes right now. Um, in the in a way that makes sense for your family, that is safe in terms of social distancing and following all of those guidelines. But it it gives you the fresh air and it can help make you happier, more productive each day. Remembering that technology is a tool, and we don't want to spend all the, our time in front of the computer. Um, and just trying to limit that. And again, that kind of ties back into those instructional minutes and expectations um, where breaking it up over time sort of helps us. And then remembering um, just to be kind to one another on our Zooms and on our chats and keeping those pieces in the forefront of our mind as well. And Whitney, we had a question yes. from John. Okay. Um, his question is, Whitney, did the team create the adapted distance learning timeline or is that published somewhere? And I'm guessing it's the instructional minutes. Um, I'm trying to get out of the sun so I can see a little bit better. I apologize. Um, so in reference to this page here, this was um, based on conversations with different grade level teams, checking in with the different grade level teams on what they were doing. Um, to make sure Norm have a six and a half hour day for students and in distance learning, that just is not a reasonable amount of time for someone to, for a child to be in front of the computer. So we wanted to come up with an expectation and a way to break it out that made sense uh, for the different children at the different age levels. So this was a, this was a local decision. All of the decisions um, that are in our learning plan are local decisions because there's not been um, a lot of hard and fast rules that have been set forth by the CDE. Does that answer the question, John? Okay. Um, real quick, Joe, you had a couple of questions directed towards you. One from John was, could we do a Zoom graduation ceremony? Possibly. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's something that um, people have talked about. Um, I, I don't, I don't know um, at this point, but yeah, it's a possibility. And the second question is from Ashley. She would like to know now that SMS is up and running with online learning, is there a plan to add another day of math and grammar instruction each week? There's currently mm -hmm. There's currently not a plan for that at this time. Um, we're kind of sticking with our our classes right now. Um, you know, this is all this is all subject to change. You know, if we find ourselves in a spot next year where we're back in this or we're not, whatever, you know, we're we're open to adapt and change. But you know, right now we're kind of trying to keep it how it is and work out any kinks and and try to figure out what works best for us in this last month of school. Um, teachers do offer one-on-one -on -one instruction. Um, all, all teachers have offered one-on-one -on -one instruction office hours. So if students need some extra help or anything of that nature, they're more than welcome to schedule one-on-ones. I know Lynn was texting me. Lynn Hanneking was telling me that she had ran five one-on-one -on -one sessions for math today. 
Um, so one-on-one -on -one sessions are available. They're great. And I highly encourage them for all parents. Okay. And I, and sorry, just to kind of back onto that before the next question, um, I, I think it's important to note that in addition to that instructional and check-in, there's also teachers are offering office hours. They're offering for um, students to call them, email them, reach out to them in, in a lot of different ways. So there's a lot of that support being given from teachers as well, just to kind of piggyback off of what, it, what Joe was saying. Okay, and then we do have another question from Hope, but I think it will fit better at the end of the presentation when we open it up for discussion and questions. So Hope, I wanted to let you know I did see that, and I think we'll, we'll get to that one after the learning plan is finished. Sound good, everybody? And we are caught up. Okay. So one of the questions that we got from a lot of parents is, how do I know that my child is learning everything that they need to know? I'm going to actually scroll this down a little bit so that you can um, start to read while I'm kind of talking about the why behind this piece. Um, so we put together... this end of year standards page in our distance learning plan. Distance, and it's a tricky piece to have because we don't want to overwhelm parents as well. So um, it's important to note that our curriculum expectations haven't changed. We're still using our adopted materials. Um, we're still following the common course. Right, it can be very Very overwhelmed level teams with a list of um, kind of essential or power standards. Would they be ready? We can teach. And there are more things that teachers are teaching and going over. Um, they're trying to in class, but taught and reiterated. Uh, um, several times. I'm going to scroll down what they're learning and um yes we are doing new instruction we are teaching them new things it's a lot of finding main ideas and details supporting text with text evidence um writing with a uh, grade level of appropriate grammar and syntax and looking at all of those pieces um and then what you'll see as i go into the middle school piece is I have the same message up at the top of the screen, just in case there are parents um, have middle school students. I don't want them to miss out on that message again that many of the skills have already been addressed in this school year. Um, and again, if if parents need to, if they feel concerned and they feel like something is missing, their child isn't going to be ready to encourage them to reach out to their teacher because their teachers really are the experts in this situation and they have a lot to offer. Um, in this situation. And so it looks, I can see the chat is popping up. So I want to. Okay. So hopes we put in the parking lot. Um, John did ask how will the LCAP report be adjusted to address the distance learning curveball, which probably should go in the parking lot as well for after um, the distance learning plan. Um, but Jasmine had a question on, is the need to know standards fairly consistent with IXL standards and how IXL bases their grade level diagnostic assessment? So IXL, when you log in as a parent to the IXL program, um, Let's say, for example, that you're going into the math portion of IXL learning. What you will see is a page full of end of year standards that um, we would hope that in, an, in a regular year we would be able to address in a classroom setting. Um, 
So using IXL as a tool to hit those power standards, I think is a great resource for us. I love that they have extended it into social studies and science, but it's a really great program um, that we have currently for the language arts and math piece. So it's, again, it's kind of that IXL sort of gets into the minutia of what we want students to know. And going back to these, this is what, um, these are kind of the, the bigger picture concepts that IXL breaks them down into, into, into the more minute details. Does that answer your question, Jasmine? I can't uh, see. Hi. <laughs> uh, yeah, that does that answer my question. I was looking at it um, from the perspective of when you see that assessment where it shows sort of like a grade level and whether your students at that grade level, would we be able to kind of get a, a, an idea of where our student is if it's saying, you know, she's in the middle of second grade or something like that? Is that a good benchmark for us as parents to use? Um, just because it's a very easy thing for us to get. I think that just kind of depends on what your student is doing, uh, which skills they're they're working on in IXL. Um, that's a really great question. I think it's a it, I think it's a good indicator. I don't think it's a perfect indicator. I don't think it's I don't think it's the thing we should look at. If that helps. Okay. I don't think it's a bad thing to look at. I think it's going to give you a pretty good idea of where your kid is, but I also don't think that it should be the end all be all. Like he's not doing well in IXL. That could really just have to do with what skills are you looking at in IXL? Are you, are you working on, um, are you working on grade level standards or above grade level standards or below grade level standards? And are you doing the diagnostic arena once a week? There's a lot of different factors that come into play with IXL. So it will help you to sort of see where their skill level is, but it's not, um, it's not perfect as okay. a tool. Thank you, Whitney. And other than the two questions in the parking lot, Whitney, that we are caught up in our chat questions. All right, thank you, Krista. Okay, moving on now to the grading piece. This has been a question on everybody's mind, and this is a new conversation at the administrative level as well. We were um, looking to see what the guidance was going to be from the California Department of Education. We were looking to see what other districts were going to be putting out. Um, in terms of the secondary level, we're seeing a lot of um, we're seeing a lot of hold harmless models in terms of grading, especially because at the secondary level, it's tied so closely and I mean directly to their their ability to graduate from high school and to enter a, a, a college. Um, so we built our plan with that hold harmless piece in mind. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the why before I go into the details of the plan. So looking at the screen, I'm going to talk more about the purpose. Um, so what we want to make sure is that students are not penalized for things that are out of their control. We don't know what their lives are like at home. Every one of that's coming through that's coming through our, our Zooms and to our Google Classroom. We don't know if we have older kids who are responsible for helping younger kids learn and, by, and parents who are not home or parents who are working and who are unable to support them until the end of the day. So that whole harmless piece, that equity piece was a huge part for us in developing this grading policy. Um, but we also didn't want to do away with any sort of accountability. We wanted to make this accountability so that we did have regular attendance from our students, that they were checking into their Zooms daily or as they were happening, that they were completing or at least attempting to complete the work. Um, and we really want that third trimester report card to be the historical record that we maintain so that if in a year or two we see that one of our students has learning gaps, we can go back and look and be like, oh, that was the year they were in second grade. I'm just using second grade because I have a second grader. Um, they were in second grade during the school shutdowns and that was when they were supposed to learn about how to do measurement and that's probably why they're struggling with some of this geometry stuff as just one example. So for that historical record piece. Um, and we really want to recognize students for the effort that they put forth given whatever circumstances that they and their families are in. So that being said, looking at through the lens of equity, K-5, our instructional leadership team um, was amazing in having this conversation and working through this. 
Uh, we decided that we were not going to give grades of a one, two, three, or four on our third trimester report card. And we were not going to give effort grades for the core subject areas, um, the other areas, or the behaviors that promote learning. There are three sections on the K-5 report card. Um, instead, as we've done in the past for evaluating skills, um, we will place an X in the column for the skills that were introduced for language arts and math again, for that historical record piece during the third trimester. So that will look very similar to what parents have seen on the report cards in the past. And we talked about including an insert to explain this piece to parents a little bit better as we get closer. And then including in report card comments and in their QM folders, language about distance learning, um, again, for that historical record piece. In grades six through eight, we will not give letter grades of A, B, C, D, or F for the third trimester report card. Um, they'll assess their students based on participation in Zoom meeting and work completion. Teachers will place an E, that's that evaluated piece that we talked about with K-5, um, evaluated or introduced what was put out to the students. They were offered the curriculum and the opportunity to learn it. Um, so that will show up in their marks column instead of an A through F grade. And then the, um, the effort grade of O, S, or U will replace the citizenship grade. And again, the language on the report card about us being in shelter in place and distance learning and school closures. And Whitney, we have a question from Adam. Yes. Will there be a set time for reteaching next year to recover some of the material that is being introduced during distance learning, or will that be addressed during normal formative assessment as lessons go on? So the conversations that we've had as a leadership team um, that I've had with my staff as a principal as well, and I'm sure the other principals have too, is we are not in a unique situation right now. I mean, it's unique. The situation itself is unique, but we are all in the same place together. So the conversation we're having is that we know that students are going to come in with gaps. So we'll need to do some kind of assessment at the beginning of the year to see where they're coming in and what knowledge they're coming in with to see where we need to address and uh, read and fill in those. I'm in a meeting. I, if, does that answer your question, Adam? Yeah, he said thanks. Okay, great. Okay, any other questions on the grading piece? We're caught up with the chat questions. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Moving down now to technology resources. So again, Joe put together an amazing website. The COVID website is absolutely amazing. And I didn't want to fill this document because there are so many great resources out there. We have companies coming out of the weeds to give us all the free stuff right now. <laughs> all the free resources for us and for parents. So what I really wanted to focus on in here is just how are we communicating and how are we instructing our students? How are we interacting with them? So really focusing on the student pieces of communication versus the parent piece of communication. So we're using Parent Square primarily to communicate with parents. Uh, teachers are doing this through a variety of ways. They're posting messages, they're posting lessons, they're posting videos. Um, and they're also communicating privately with parents when parents have issues. So this has been a great tool for us this year. Um, in terms of the curriculum that's being pushed out to the students, we've got Google Classroom at grades four through eight, which is where our, um, I'm sorry, grades three through eight, that's a typo, I'll, I'll fix that before the final version. Um, and using that to push out assignments, have students turn in assignments, any kind of um, assessments that are being done, um, informal assessments that are being done. Um, Zoom codes are all going out through there. It really helps with that privacy piece. Um, and then at the lower, the primary grade levels, we're seeing Seesaw, which is a similar setup to, to Google Classroom, but it's a lot more user-friendly for our littles. It's an easy way to navigate what work is it needs to be turned in and there are really great ways to, to overlay um, 
their answers onto a worksheet that's been uploaded or to record their answers and submit it to their teachers that teachers can share videos, um, all the things they can do through Google Classroom, but in a platform that's a lot simpler for our younger kiddos to use. Um, and then finally, just those Zooms for a variety of reasons. So we're using them for instruction, we're using them for content, we're using them to share videos. Um, I know Miss Katie has come in on Zooms and done some social emotional lessons, we're doing check-ins. So Zoom has been really a great tool for us as well in terms of our technology resources for communication. And I can see that there are some questions. Chris, I think you're muted still. There we go. Sorry about that. And a motorcycle just went by. Um, John asked if there was going to still be cast testing, and Gina did answer that all testing has been suspended for this year. The plan is that cast been cast administration will resume in 2021. And then he had a follow up question: um, What about the multiple measure testing at the end of the year? The multiple measures conversation is one that we've had. We don't feel that there's a way to administer that test in a whole harmless environment, especially because it is, is meant to be a standardized assessment uh, administered in a standardized way. So when we're looking at data for next year, we'll uh, use our second trimester data points because we do have that multiple measure data point as well. Um, but in terms of state multiple measures in regard to the dashboard, um, that is still an ongoing conversation with the CDE. I was in a webinar yesterday and uh, they're flying around a couple of scenarios and there are no answers in terms of that multiple measure at this point in time. John, does that answer your question? He replied with, okay, thanks, makes sense. <laughs> Perfect. Great. And that catches us up catches us up with our chat question. Okay. Excellent. So the next piece we have, um, and we're getting towards the end, just a couple more pages to get through. Um, we have, and this PDF that I've put together, um, all of these links, everything in here is clickable. So as a resource for parents, they don't have to go and type in the URL. They can access all of these um, all of these websites directly just with a click on a picture or on the link itself. So we're, we have a lot of great resources, as I've mentioned a couple of times on our COVID website. Um, and then just the communications that we do regularly through our school website as well, just kind of keeping that in the forefront of our mind as a communication resource as, as, at a bigger district level. And then the social media piece, uh, all three of us have tried to put fun stuff on our Instagrams to, to bring everyone together. There's not a lot of um, instruction. There's no instruction going on on our social media pages, but there's um, Toro Park this week is doing an Earth Day Mr. Eco Challenge. Um, Washington Union this year, this week um, is working on movement. And there are just a bunch of different things that we're doing to engage and to give kids another platform to be able to see each other uh, while we're social distancing. It is not a perfect system, but um, I know the kids really enjoy seeing each other. The, the, the messages that I get are really sweet and really kind, not only from parents, but from students as well on those social media posts. Um, the next piece that I have is our social emotional resource page. And I, I've tried to talk about that a lot in this in this whole um, presentation because the academic piece, yes, is very important, but I, I think Katie said it and maybe she got it from somewhere, but it's, it's really stuck in my head that students might not remember everything that we've taught them and they might not remember everything they learned when they get out of this, but they are definitely going to remember how they felt going through all of this. And um, we talk a lot about student mental health and we have a lot of great resources again on our COVID page on the social emotional resources tab on the COVID page. Um, but I also want to remember and to remind parents that your mental health is important too. And um, to take time for yourself. And so I just put some resources for families um, there are so many more. Katie has done a great job of just providing lots and lots of resources for families. Um, so I just kind of picked my top four um, and the ones that I thought could could kind of cover a broad uh, spectrum. But definitely there are more 
uh, social emotional resources on our website. And again, these are all clickable as you can see that it uh, changes. What with. And then our last page is the I need help page. Something's not working. I don't know what to do. Where can I go for support? Um, because we're in a kind of assignment messaging with your teacher in some way. If it's uh, in regards to a device or parent square or login, Mr. Carnazzo is your tech guru uh, in terms of curriculum. My email address is on there. For Google Classroom and Google Meet and Zoom, we've got um, an expert who works at Washington School but has uh, worked with Toro Park staff. So he's supporting the Toro Park staff in that regard too. His name's Andrew White. And then at Washington, we have Kennedy Lewis. Uh, the email contact for Katie Linforth, and then all of our, our amazing special education department, Carissa, who is the head of it, and then the case managers at the various sites, our speech and language pathologist, Lindley Stover, and our occupational therapist, Allie Baker. And then just what kind of communication to sort of expect on a daily or weekly basis. Um, principals have been reaching out weekly Teachers are reaching out at least weekly, but mostly more than that, and just communicating, communicating, communicating. I think um, that is, is what we need to do, and just we're all in this together, and it's weird, and it's hard for all of us, and so just knowing kind of who to go to uh, is kind of where I wanted to end the distance learning plan um, so that you know who to go to if you have a question. I didn't want that to get lost kind of in the middle, just a nice place to end it. So that is the end of our distance learning plan. Um, if you could just jump in, jumping back to John's question, Rick, yes. how will the LCAP report be adjusted to address distance learning? That's an excellent question, and it is one that has not yet been answered by the state. They are still in talks trying to figure out everything with the LCAP. It sounds like they are leaning towards suspending the written portion of the LCAP for this year. We still have the supplemental funds. Um, there is no direct guidance. We don't have a clear answer for what happens to supplemental money that we don't spend, um, assuming that it might roll over, but we, we're, we're just kind of waiting for our final guidance on that. They keep kind of pushing it and pushing it. Um, hopefully we'll know more next week. <laughs> okay, and I am jumping back into Hope's question. All right, teachers, this one is for you. Hope says, we are hearing how the days are organized for the kids. Could we, oops, my screen changed. Uh, let me find it again. Could we hear from some of the teachers about what their day looks like? What is happening outside of the Zoom meetings or Google Classroom? What are some of your biggest challenges? Carissa, can I answer? Yes, please. Okay, this is uh, Lulu Brigham. So my uh, work week looks like this. Every Monday, students have a new lesson that they're working on that needs to be turned in the following week. And on Wednesdays, we have our Zoom classes. Mine lasts roughly between 30 minutes and an hour where I meet with every single class that I have, just like I normally would have during my work week at school when we were physically in class. So we would review the material in that particular lesson, we would answer questions, and the students have been instructed at the time that I'm reviewing, and they can see me on the screen, to have their work pulled up on their computer screen, and they're uh, uh, adjusting re uh, the material that they've submitted to me, they're correcting material, and then they resubmit all of that work so that I know that they've been paying attention in the Zoom class, and that they've corrected their work. During the remainder of the work week, I get approximately 250 Zoom assignments from the kids that they're submitting that I'm, that I'm uh, grading, entering into my grade book and returning to the students. I'm talking with parents with, uh, about students who haven't attended Zoom class for whatever reason. I've talked to kids. I'm emailing both parents and kids as well as speaking to them over the phone. 
I'm prepping for the next class of Zoom where, you know, I would normally do that prep regularly. I'm doing it now while I'm at home. So, and I'm also responding to emails between the hours of nine to three that, uh, from parents and kids. And I'm using my office hours to have sometimes one-on-one uh, sessions with the kids who have, for some reason, not been able to attend a Zoom class. So it's pretty much packed because the emails don't stop at three o'clock, you know, and work being submitted from the kids doesn't stop. Sometimes I'll be doing work until 10 o'clock because that's when the kids can get into the computer and have kids submitting things even as late as 1130 in the evening. So, I, you know, I tr I'm not on the computer at, at 11, but I certainly do see the time stamp uh, when work has been admitted, submitted into Zoom. Okay, thanks, Lulu. Uh, Brie Hogue. Go ahead, Brie. Hi, everybody. Um, so my day looks a little different than Lulu's. Um, it's not quite as packed. It's a little bit um, different in fifth grade. So I have week uh, three Zoom meetings a week. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And we meet anywhere between half an hour to an hour. And I um, go over what the kids are working on, answer any questions that they have kind of, we visit that social emotional piece. We've been lucky to have um, Miss Katie sit in on a few or on one and we had a mindful minute and Miss Myers mm -hmm. sat in on a mindful minute and um, the social emotional piece for my fifth graders, it's huge. Uh, when they found out that we weren't going back to campus, it was a very emotional um, Zoom meeting for us all. I had kids crying. I was emotional myself. Miss Meyer was emotional. She sat in on that one. It was really hard, but I'm... Um, I've been lucky that my kids uh, will send me messages themselves. So I'm not having to deal with a whole lot of parents at this point. The kids have really taken on uh, the responsibility and accountability for their learning. So I check their assignments when they turn it in. I get a hold of parents when they haven't turned them in. Um, and then I have my own social emotional piece that I need to deal with too, because this has been so hard for me to not be at work. I feel like I'm not uh, needed in, in a sense, which is a struggle, you know, I'm a teacher, I'm supposed to be in the classroom and not supposed to be teaching from my house in a t-shirt and shorts and seeing my kids on a computer screen. So I'm dealing with that side as well. And um, I can speak for my team members as well, that, that we're all, all working on the social emotional piece together and just making sure that the kids are not stressing out about uh, their getting a score, but not really getting a score at the same time, but just making sure that they feel confident in themselves and their abilities to do things on their own um, with a little bit of support from their parents. Great. Thank you, Brie. Okay, Kylie, you're up. Kylie, you there? Hello. <laughs> I think she muted herself. She's not muted, but I think her headphones maybe aren't working. Yeah. Oh, we don't have any. We don't have any audio for Kylie. <laughs> Christina, did you want to weigh in? Um, sure. I, I mean, kind of similar. Uh, so I teach seventh grade. So um, the way I've been doing my lessons is the students have a daily lesson that always starts out with a video of me. Um, uh, I'm trying to preemptively answer all the questions that would come up in class. So um, sometimes I'm doing lectures or little demonstrations or things like that. But a lot, a lot of times I'm kind of just walking through the assignment with students, showing them how to access it online. Like answering any questions that have come up or that I think will come up and then um, sending off that work to the students and then I spend a lot of time grading, answering emails, reaching out to parents and students, trying to keep track of everyone. Um, I would say that's that I thank you, Hope, for asking about challenges teachers face. Um, 
you know, for students who may not have been quite as engaged, even when we were in school, it's a big challenge when they're out of school, as we can all imagine. And so I think um, that's a challenge. How do you reach those students who weren't particularly engaged in school, but you had the power to walk over next to them and say, okay, let's talk about what's going on now. It's a lot harder to do that. Um, and then planning for the next day's lessons, planning for my Zoom classes. Um, I also wanted to say I had just reached out to another couple of teachers and um, they are echoing, I'm just looking at my phone right now, they're echoing kind of the same sort of thing is um, how to be supportive of these students while also having families of our own and supporting our own kids um, and providing all the academic resources that we want our students to have and at the same time um, providing social emotional support and then taking care of ourselves and taking care of our families. I'm sure it's the same kind of challenges a lot of us are experiencing just being working adults. But I would say those are kind of the biggest challenges. But overall, I feel really impressed with the way my students have stepped up. I feel like they're really doing a great job. I think that's all I want to say. Thank you very much. Miss Katie, you want to weigh in here? Sure. Um, so kind of like what, uh, what everyone else has echoed, I've been really impressed by everyone at all of the different schools. It's an amazing team that is collaborating together to support students and make sure that nobody's falling through the cracks, um, reaching out for one another, recognizing that this is hard for staff, this is hard for parents, this is hard for our kids. What we're going through is presenting a lot of challenges and also a lot of opportunities for us to learn and grow. And, and um, we've proven that we're doing it and we're going to be able to keep doing it one day at a time as long as we're collaborating and using those supports and um, working as a team. So what what I've do you want me to do an update about what I'm doing or my challenges? So so what, what I'm doing is if anyone's wondering what I'm doing um, as a school counselor working remotely, what my day looks like um, in, in writing down notes kind of about what I've been doing I'm, I'm checking off some of the same dom domains that I did when I was doing in-person school counseling as far as supporting students individually in small groups and then in the classroom as well. Um, I've been really lucky to be invited by several different teacher teachers to join their Zoom lessons and um, facilitating mindful minutes with teachers that that was part of their classroom um, culture before. Also doing some checking in and connecting with students um, also thinking about how I can support the parent population and, and recognizing what, what a lot of people touched on, that this is hard for parents as well, um, and, and trying to share resources, um, but not be overwhelming with resources is kind of, I think, the, the balance that we're all doing at this point as, as our inboxes are flooded with wonderful suggestions and tools um, about you know how to how to share those things that are going to be most helpful and also get some support. So we're having a parent um, Zoom on Thursday tomorrow night uh, to just give parents that opportunity for some community and, and connection with each other um, in this in the different small groups. It's been a really great opportunity to connect with the students and for them um, to connect with one another. Having a lot of time for conversation, I think, has been really, really helpful for them. Um, so I think. Like what other people have um, already said, my biggest challenge is trying to reach those students that um, aren't maybe participating in, in their, their life, congratulate them on the things that they are, are doing well to help them um, make improvements. And I, I know a message that I'm getting consistently from students um, is how much they appreciate their, their teacher's office hours or those one-on-one -on -one conversations that they get to have with their teachers, how much that means to them. A lot of, especially the, the little ones over at Toro, when I talk with them, um, you know, they really tell me that the, that time to see their teacher is a, like a bright spot in their day and something that really means a lot and to see their friends. So um, just continuing to work with this amazing team of students, teachers, staff, um, Parents, everybody has been really building this plane as we fly, and I've been really impressed. So I hope that people will, will continue to reach out, and I can help um, how I'm able, and we'll keep keep on keeping on. That was maybe more than you bargained for, Gina, with your question. No, that was but. great. No, 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 that was exactly <laughs> perfect. That was perfect, Katie. Um, 
Thank you all. So, you know, if there's anything else, this is really an opportunity for discussion. If there's any questions, Whitney has something. Go ahead. I just wanted to address Hope's question um, from the chat about the distance learning plan. It is not on the website. We wanted to bring it, uh, we wanted to bring it here first and have the conversation about it here first. Uh, before we put it out to staff and to parents and to teachers and 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 just not not to teachers they help build it but to put it all out there uh, we wanted to have that conversation here first so it will be on the website eventually soon Great. and then a couple more comments from the chat as the chat room monitor uh, we had John saying, Lulu, thanks for the update. Thank you to all the teachers for this extraordinary effort, exclamation mark. So thank you, John, for that. And John also said, the parent Zoom is a great idea. And we're all caught up in our chat and our parking lot. OK. Kylie, are you up now? Is it working? Can you? Cool. There you are. Can you hear right me? There. Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, good. Okay. Um, just kind of touching, everyone kind of covered uh, kind of what I was going to say, but usually for, for me, my, my day starts at around um, like 7.30 is usually when I start like preparing for the day. But Mondays, um, I send out a weekly schedule for my kids so that they know what to expect from me and what's going to be posted that week. Um, some weeks I may post, uh, the assignments on Monday that they'll be working on that week, especially for, um, uh, like grammar, that's pretty common. Um, and then, uh, grammar also is pretty structured to where they do spelling certain days. We, we still had in spelling. We were able to, um, kind of differentiate that and digitize it to a way where it's still kind of, um, working with that skill. And then, um, now that we're going over to more of, the not giving a letter grade um, instead of giving them like a point value on like essays, for example, they're doing their first one. Um, I am more just giving feedback on it. So most of my day is kind of spent with um, preparing my Zoom classes aren't till the end of the week, Thursdays and Fridays. Um, and I have uh, both my grammar classes on Thursday and then all three of my literature classes on Friday. And so I kind of prepare for those meetings on those days. Um, and then I do offer to my kids um, if they, I have my office hours on those days, but then if they need extra help, um, I just ask them to send me an email. And usually we can do one-on-one uh, -on -one Zoom lessons earlier in the week if they need help with something. So it was pretty common for um, like grammar when they were working on their first essay. But um, so every day is different, <laughs> um, but it's uh, kind of like what Lulu said is a lot of it is, sending emails and, um, you know, kind of answering those and kind of reassuring parents kind of at this point, at least what it's been the last week, um, you know, with kind of saying like, it's okay if stuff is turned in late and, um, you know, don't, don't worry about it. Don't put stress on yourself or stress on your kids. Just sometimes an assignment gets missed and, you know, just, just keep checking on it. And, and that's what we're there for. So that's it. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, Lori and Mike, we haven't heard from any Toro teachers. Did you guys have anything to weigh in on that you'd like to discuss? Can you hear my voice? I can. Okay. So I just, what I, what I did for my kids, or I tried to do anyways, is I tried to s structure the 93 time slot the same way I, I would do in my classroom. So every day there's a daily schedule with lessons. Um, and it, it parallels and resembles the schedule we would do in the classroom um, a lot. For example, I have scheduled snack recess and lunch recess, and we still do PE on Wednesdays and and Fridays. And I'll you know have a list of exercises that they've done with me that they're familiar with that they can do. Um, and I think that's been pretty well received in general. I, I sent out a little survey to the parents this last week. And the schedule, for the most part, has helped. Of course, a lot of them can't follow the schedule because if they have two or three different kids they're teaching and and all of that, and a lot of them are still working. So um, so that's kind of how my day goes. I, I plan it. There's a lot of, in the Seesaw platform, the kids submit their work, and I can look at it, and I can 
I can make comments and send it back to them to, to fix it. So I do, I spend a lot of my time doing that. I spend a lot of my time just, uh, communicating through texting, um, and even some phone calls with parents. Um, I, I started because in the classroom, the kids would, every kid would read to me every day and I miss doing that with them. So on Thursdays and Fridays, I, I'm calling into their houses and having them read to me. Um, so I, and so it's kind of a directory and we I'm recording my voice, reading their stories and trying to get them to follow along like we would do if we were doing a whole, whole class reading or something like that. I do find I have some downtime that I'm not comfortable with. So like, well, what am I doing here? Not earning my money here. So I got to find some, you know, so there's some downtime that I wouldn't have in a classroom that I'm not comfortable with, but I'm getting used to it. So I think it's going pretty well. I think the kids for the most part, all participating parents are, helping the best they can. The reading I've heard has been pretty good, actually, and a lot of, especially with some of my SPED kids, I'm really happy with the reading I'm hearing. So I, th I think that they're going to be ready for third grade. I'm not, I'm not too, too worried. A lot of the more difficult concepts in math have already been taught, and the last part of the school year, the math is much easier. It's measurement and, and telling time and graphs and things like that, more visual stuff. So, but... I, I think they're going to be ready. And, I, and we could, of course, the second grade team communicates constantly and we're you know, trying to stay together and keep it going and helping each other. And, and my teammates are, you know, much more creative than I am. So I'm always stealing their ideas and using them. <laughs> um, 